Hello everyone, I'm Giuseppe Sec, and today we're going to be talking about emulating IoT firmware with Kimu. Just as a quick who am I, I'm an analyst. I help out with the IoT Village, and in my free time, I make videos on my personal YouTube about web application security, uh, mobile, IoT, just whatever I'm interested in at the time. Uh, I'm probably burying the lead a little bit there, so I should say if anime isn't your thing I guess don't check out my channel <laughs> so what I'm gonna be doing here is showing you guys how I went about emulating the web interface on the uh, D-Link DCS 932L one of the easiest ways you're gonna be able to find firmware is just to Google for the vendor page and in this case the D-Link just lets us download it right here I've already downloaded it and extracted the contents that were compressed into the bin file using binwalk command kind of like that we'd use the MER flag so it just recursively goes through all the directories that are compressed into the bin file and if we list the contents of that you can see it goes pretty deep there were multiple directories in there until it got to one directory called CPIO root and in there is our what looks like just a slightly modified Linux file system What's kind of unique about this device is that the CPIO archive or a CPIO file system is something that just runs in RAM and usually when I extract the file system from IoT firmware it's going to be a squash file system so th this uh, this D-Link is kind of unique in that sense I guess um, anyway you can see I've compressed it into a tar file and then I just SCP'd it over into our Mipsil VM running via Kimu here if you don't have a Mipsil VM or you don't know how to make a QCAL 401, I'm going to make a video about that on my personal YouTube. It's just a bit of a lengthy process, so we're not going to cover it here. However, uh, you will have to install the Kimu System MIPS package. I believe that's the same package name for Arch and Debian based distributions as well. And that's going to allow you to emulate MIPS, Mipsil, Mipsil 64, etc. And, uh, I used a command kind of like this. We were specifying the uh, our QCAL image with the HDA flag, our, C our CPU specified with the M. Uh, this is for our kernel file, this is for our initial RAM disk, uh, speci specifies how much RAM we're using, and uh, all this is just for like uh, mapping network stuff so that we can have access to ports 80, 443, and 22 on the VM. We're just forwarding it to the uh, similar ports on the host. Anyway, if that makes sense, let's get into this file system here. Then we can uh, ch root into there. And it just looks like we are emulating user space now. So in order to emulate the web interface we are gonna have to run this alpha PD binary the issue is that when we run it we get an error and it doesn't specify what the file name is or where the file is it just apparently it needs to be able to open it so what I did was I took the alpha PD binary and tossed it into Ghidra and I analyzed it a bit and now I can just go to search here go to program text and we want to select well we want to check all the boxes here and then we want to paste the string we want to search for and we go to search all and that's already found a uh, instance of that string we want uh, my tiling manager is being weird so let's go to that instance of that string and that looks like it's in the dot text section of the binary. So if we just double click it, it'll take us to the function that uses that string. And it looks like the string occurs when it cannot open a var run alpha pd.pid file. So we're just going to copy that. And back in the VM, we will let's list the contents of var. Okay, so we have to make a run directory in var. And now we can just create that file. And to make my life a little bit easier, if I have to rerun that at any point, I'll just make a startup script. Uh, 
Okay, so now let's try and run Alpha PD again. And we get a lot more errors. So let's create this file. And the NVRAM daemon, well, NVRAM is a uh, non-volatile RAM. That's usually something that's uh, loaded externally from like an external drive or something. So we're going to have to emulate that because since we are in a VM, we don't have any external drives to do that with. So let's see. Um, let's do this first and see if the directory exists. It does. Okay. So let's touch that in to make my life a little easier. Okay, now, um, what was that error? Waiting for NVRAM daemon. Let's see if we can find that in Ghidra. Get back to the beginning text and see if we can do anything there. And then go to program text and search for that. There it is. Let's click on this portion here so we can go to the function that's being called in. Hmm. Well, that's probably really small for you, but it looks like it's in the main function. And it looks like that error shows up when it cannot find this file here. And there's the uh, dbgofl zma that we created as well. Okay, so let's uh, did I copy that already? <laughs> Add that to our startup script and run our startup script. Um, now what happens if we run alpha PD? Oh boy, we get a lot more output. And we are running into that issue with the non-volatile RAM. It's unable to load it because it's supposed to be mounting it from a device directory. There's no such directory. Cool, cool. It looks like we're also getting SSL errors. Unable to load random state, so we're probably gonna have to create a rand file and rand files are gonna help us What's gonna help SSL to create certificates? So what we can do um, Let's do it a lazy way. We're just gonna create a dot rnd file just in the root. I will create a uh, environment variable Just make it home point to the current working directory and then we will make that rand file uh, environment variable and have it point to home dot rnd and now for the nvram what we're going to have to do you can just um, google for the firmadyne project they already have an nvram emulator we can just you know get that to the uh, vm some editing you're going to have to do since this is a bit of an older project uh, somewhere around um, here from line 338 to line 342 you're gonna want to delete that conditional branch it's not necessary um, I have already done that to make my life a little bit easier Oof, messed up there. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is having trouble showing us Vim in the uh, VM. <laughs> anyway. So I've already edited out uh, that that uh, conditional branch, so I can just run make. You will have to install GCC in your VM, and we've created this libnvram shared object. So back in our um, no wait, yes, back in our 
root directory here. What we'll have to do is create a uh, Firmidine directory. And in the Firmidine directory, we'll have to, uh, why didn't I just do it that way? We'll have to create a libnvram directory in there, as well as a libnvram.override. Ah, shoot. And then we can just move the uh, shared object into the Fermidine directory, just into the Fermidine one will be fine. And if you're confused about that, it, it goes over that in the, in the documentation here. So now we can ch root back into our file system. And um, let's double check everything here. Okay, doke. Now we'll have to create a environment variable that loads that called uh, LD preload. It's going to point to the shared object. Uh, we're going to have to create that ran file variable, the ran file variables again. Uh, and run the startup script. And now we should try that again. And, uh, well, it doesn't seem like we're having trouble the SSL or the NVRAM. And now we are unable to get an IP address from sysinfo. So let's get back into Ghidra, see if we can find out what the cause of that is. Text. Can't get LAN info. There's a string web startup. Okay, so there's a conditional branch here. It seems like... So what I think is the cause of this is that it's getting sysinfo from a GPIO pin. And we don't have GPIO pins because we are in a VM. So if I'm just a, if I can just patch... So basically the if here is correlating to this B and E uh, instruction in the assembly basically says if it's not equal to etc cetera, etc cetera, then it's going to jump to uh you can see here this is where it branches all the way down here and then it goes to a completely different function now we want to i believe we just want to continue into this flow here uh so what we're gonna have to do is patch this so we can right click we can right click this instruction here go to patch instruction And all we really need to do is get rid of these, this portion here, and we can change the instruction to a J, press enter, and we have patched it. And we have to save, and then we can go to file, export program, um, the file type we want to export it as, we'll have to specify elf. And I will export it to you. There's the working directory on the host. I'm doing, I'm doing stuff from. Sure, that'll work. I. 
cool. Now back on the host, I believe that should be fine. There's the uh, alpha PD we just patched, so we're just gonna SCP that over to the VM. It's probably going to take a little bit of time because VM's slow. Um, yeah, let's get out of the ch root. Yep, we got it. So uh, let's move the alpha PD. Into um, one back, and then let's move the original alpha PD that's in the bin directory one back and call it alpha PD dot old, and then let's move the patched alpha PD into the bin directory here. Uh, and let's make it executable. That would be necessary. <laughs> and let's ch root into the file system. And let's run the startup script. Get the environment variables back up again. Uh, lib and v ram.so um, uh, current looking one and then ram file um, ohm <laughs> and let's try and run alpha pd again Okay, so basically what I think is going to happen, yep, so because we're not able to get an IP address, it's just like, okay, well now everything's just running on all interfaces on port 80. So now we should just be able to visit our local host and boom, we got it. Haha. -ha. Um, so yeah, this is by no means a uh, going to be universal. Each instance of a machine that you're trying to uh, emulate is going to be trial and error. It's never going to be this quick. Uh, this this took me weeks, and um, but hopefully that will give you an idea of just like um, you know troubleshooting essentially reading the errors and trying to correlate them to the contents of the binary that can really help understanding the flow of the uh the execution of the binaries as well um so yeah i i hope that was at least interesting to you guys so thanks for watching <laughs>